All right, good morning. Uh, why don't we get started? It's just gone 7.30. Uh, I'll try to look over to St. Paul's. Hope you can see me. Uh, Bev, maybe you can wave your hands if you can hear me. Yeah, perfect. Great. All right. So, good morning. Uh, welcome to Friday. Um, uh, so, Chris Poynen and I are going to share the podium today to give uh, an update on home therapies in uh, BC. I'm going to spend the first little bit talking about uh, sort of the state of the union, so to speak, uh, of uh, home hemo as well as peritoneal dialysis. I'll try to do justice to the PD. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Singh can't be with us here today because um, she's uh, on her way up to a clinic in Seashelt, um, but uh, she has shared uh, some slides with me that I'll try to uh, present. So what we'll do is we'll talk a little bit about uh, home hemo and PD programs around BC. Um, I'll do that, and then I'm going to hand over to Dr. Poynen. Uh, who will uh, talk about some of the project work and some of the uh, results that are starting to come from his project work that he's been doing as he's coming to the end of his home fellowship. Um, and then I think he'll also be able to talk about some of the uh, possibilities of work arising uh, from, uh, from the projects that he's been working on. Uh, so I do have a disclosure. I, I do get money from Next Stage um, for sitting on advisory and scientific boards. Um, I don't believe Chris has any disclosures other than that he's looking forward to not doing fellows call at the end of June. Um, so just very briefly, when we look at our prevalence numbers, uh, and a lot of this information is thanks to uh, Lee Err in particular from the renal agency who generates some great reports for us. Um, this is looking at our overall uh, numbers of independent patients in British Columbia. Uh, so we're sitting um, at around 32%, just shy of 32% at this point in time. This is a combined PD and home hemo number. So this is uh, all of our, our independent uh, uh, home-based patients. You can see our ministry target is uh, to be uh, targeting above 32%, so we're just shy of that right now. We've been, as you can see over the last couple of years, very stable and very steady at this, uh, at this uh, just shy of 30, 32% mark. When we break that down by the different home modalities, PD and home hemo, um, you can see, um, not surprisingly, PD makes up the majority of our home patients, about 26% uh, uh, prevalence in, the, in BC. Our home HEMA numbers sit around 5 to 5.5% 5 .5 and have done for, uh, I'm showing here for the last three years, but have been pretty steady there for the last seven or eight years, and uh, same would apply with, uh, with the PD. So how do we compare nationally? And this is a very busy slide, and I don't want you to have to look at it. This is from the core. But the relevant things uh, to pull it out uh, of this is that home HEMA nationally is around 4% uptake. and. Uh, the combined PD modalities are around 18%. If you actually take the time and look in the uh, sidebars here, you'll see that it actually doesn't quite match up, um, but the, if we factor out transplant, which makes up about 40% of the uh, of the numbers in here, it actually does um, you sort of almost double the, 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 the proportions that are given there. So let me talk a little bit about home hemo first. Um, uh, this is actually one of our patients uh, uh, in Vancouver, for those of you who may or may not recognize them. Happily, you can see dialyzing at home. Um, so we've actually, um, we've actually done an, an awful lot of uh, 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 work with the home hemo program around the province since we began. Um, you know, we've actually, since we began it in 2004, we've had uh, over 750 <coughs> patients enter the program. We've uh, uh, had about uh, 660 patients discharged to home. So in other words, completed their training to the point that they were able to go home. Um, we've had a number of patients that have stopped training, 107 patients that have stopped training, and we're um, uh, working out a little bit about uh, what happens to those patients. Currently sitting at about 145 to 150 patients uh, around the province on home hemo. And you can see in the red box there, about 514 of them have actually departed the program, and I'll talk about where those people go. Uh, we do have two machines, as you know. We have the, the conventional machine, the Gambro, or actually more appropriately, you know, the Baxter uh, machine, uh, which is our conventional machine. And we also use the Next Stage system. We uh, brought in the Next Stage system about three years ago. And you can see overall, we're about a one third, two third split at this point uh, for the Next Stage versus the conventional machine. Um, and you can see through the different health authorities that uh, there's uptake of the two machines in different proportions uh, uh, through each of the different programs. 
Um, this is what our uh, growth has been since we started, uh, and you can see at the beginning, uh, for the first few years where we uh, were in our building phase, we had a very impressive uh, rapid growth, and then really we've reached a, a plateau uh, phase for the last number of years, um, uh, where uh, our entries and our exits seem to be uh, about lining up with one another. When we look at about our patients coming in, and I'll just focus a little bit on the BC one over here, you can see that we'd actually been having a bit of a downward trend uh, for a number of years. Um, and then the last couple of years, although we haven't had a great increase, we have at least stabilized it. And you can see that the growth is uh, in a, per, a couple of uh, uh, programs in particular. So VHA had a very good year of patients coming in a couple of years ago in the interior of uh, this last year. So, um, but having said that, you can see, for instance, in our health authority, we're flat, if not actually slightly down in terms of our, our home numbers in Vancouver Coastal and Providence. So we, we do see the ebb and flow of the patients coming in, but we want to sort of see that trend turn around uh, more uh, permanently. Um, we're also seeing more patients coming into the program uh, for training and not being successful with it, which actually I think is a good thing um, because it's saying that we're actually pushing the margins of uh, the complexity of the patients. We're not just taking the very easy ones. I think if we had 100% of people completing their training, it means we're not trying to push the bar. So I actually, this is an encouraging thing. Uh, oh, somebody who just joined on, if you can mute, that would be great. Thank you. Hopefully you're not having a car crash or something. Um, so you can see actually we're, we're having about uh, 15 to 20 percent of our patients actually not completing the training. So it's a fairly high proportion. Um, and as we go through that, in the last couple of years in particular, we're able to start to tease out why people are not being successful. So earlier on here, um, we knew they were leaving, but you can see most of them were captured as gray bars. We didn't know why. But now we're starting to see a couple of trends. We're starting to see um, the, probably the biggest reason being the patient requesting. So in other words, once they've started training, they feel that it's not the right therapy for them. We've also got a fairly substantial amount of uh, issue with um, uh, what we're describing as cognitive impairment or learning uh, challenges. Uh, and so one of the things we're starting to talk about provincially is formalizing the intake process a little bit more so that we can pick those people up hopefully before they start their training so that some of these things may be a bit more modifiable. Um, but, um, uh, you know, this, as we'll talk about in, this, in the, some of the themes, these are the information that we can inform ourselves for what we can do next to try to improve the program going forward. Our patients are mostly still coming from either community dialysis units in the purple bar or in-center hemodialysis units in the pink bar. Uh, a few people coming from the CKD group, about 11%, uh, somewhere between 11 and 20% uh, of our patients. Um, and a relatively small number coming back from transplant or PD, but in the last year, the largest numbers that we've seen so far. So that is encouraging because we do hope to be able to capture the failing PD patients in particular. One of the big hopes when we brought in the next stage was that we would revolutionize the training time uh, because it's a much simpler machine and that's how the system was marketed to us very heavily. Um, we are not seeing a huge difference of our training time. If you look at the bottom here, it's about 45 days training on the next stage versus about 51 days on the uh, uh, conventional system. So a very modest savings. But as we're looking into that, we're seeing that much of that training time is actually spent with uh, needling uh, learning and getting comfortable with the cannulation. So if we can move that out, we may still be able to see some, uh, some time savings. But it hasn't made a massive difference at this point in time. As we look at our exits, um, and you'll see this both for hemo and for PD, we, we think about it as the top two really being non-modifiable reasons, and then the bottom ones being potentially modifiable. So we lose a lot of our home hemo patients to transplant, which is a good non-modifiable way. Um, I think also a non-modifiable way, but not a bad thing, is that a number of our patients are actually choosing to stay at home uh, and dialyze until they die at home, which is also, I think, a good thing. Um, where we have uh, some opportunities, uh, and over the years this number has been, relatively speaking, shrinking. Um, uh, medical deterioration, often we may or may not be able to intervene, but some of the other reasons, particularly um, you know, patient issues or machine issues, uh, account for uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 25 percent of our uh, program losses, so that's a, a potential opportunity for us to um, focus on getting fewer people to leave. Um, we also track the number of people that leave the home program early, so people who've trained uh, and then stop within six months. And for the most part, this is the purple line here, and it's a quite a low number. Um, but we do have, in the last couple of years, some folks that are leaving early. Um, 
And as you'll see, a lot of it is because of transplantation. So our, our exits because of transplant across the province uh, and across time has definitely been increasing. And you can see, for instance, in Vancouver Coastal, we've been particularly hit, and I put that in quotation marks, obviously. Uh, we've had a lot of our folks leave um, the home program for transplantation. Um, so we're not uh, worried about that, but it is a resource effect as we're training these folks. Um, most of those people are not leaving early though, so that's the, the key. And in fact, if you look at our, this is not patient survival, this is uh, all comer modality survival. You can see the median time that people are on home hemo in BC is around 31 months. Um, um, but we do have about, uh, um, what is that, about a 22, 23% dropout in the first year um, of people being at home. So I'll change gears now to peritoneal dialysis, and I'm not as familiar with the PD side of things, obviously, um, so uh, I'll do my best, uh, and uh, with uh, Bead and Dave in the audience and Sunit maybe listening, uh, I will apologize for any errors I make in, in the presentation part here. Um, the PD numbers um, uh, in BC account for, um, uh, as I mentioned, about 25-26% of the overall dialysis population. Um, I think that unlike other areas in Canada, we are quite a heavy user of uh, automated PD, of uh, Cycler PD, about uh, almost 70% of our patients are on Cycler, uh, about 25% on the, on the twin bags. And again, you can see uh, similar trends um, through the different health authorities for that. The prevalence has been uh, quite stable um, uh, within a point or so, uh, a percentage point uh, dating back over the last five or six years. Um, uh, these numbers are um, uh, last year's data. The, uh, the data set for the provincial face-to-face uh, -face meeting hasn't been completed yet, so I wasn't able to show this year's, but this takes us up to last year. Um, but you can see fairly uh, stable numbers uh, in terms of the PD uh, group. Uh, again, the intake uh, and the output uh, are matching one another to be maintaining that because that flat number may look like there's not very much going on, but as you can see, there's an awful lot of uh, movement in and out of the PD program. Um, most of them um, are about two-thirds of the people coming to PD uh, are coming with PD being their first dialysis modality, and about a third of them are transferring from another modality, so uh, either they've started on hemo in an unexpected manner and are transitioning over. Um, uh, so. Um, those trends have been fairly similar over time as well. This is an interesting one, and I know Chris will probably expand on this as he comes into one of his uh, projects that he's been working on, but this is looking at the people who've been on PD who were followed by the kidney care clinic, looking at the number of people that chose PD as their preferred modality, and you can see, and I think we all know this, it's between 40 and 45 percent of patients in the KCC um, document that they do want to do PD as their therapy. Then looking at where people go to, so how many of those people actually transition and convert to being on PD, and it's about an 80% um, uh, uh, conversion rate. Uh, so it's a very high uh, success rate for people who say they want to be on PD. Now there's around 20% of people that say they want to be on PD and then they're not on PD, and I think the, uh, from what I uh, understand there's uh, some work going on looking at that, and Chris will certainly uh, talk more about that particular uh, element in, in one of his um, uh, projects that he's been working on. And again, as you can see, most of the people are actually starting uh, within the first 90 days, so we would consider those that really as primary PD starts, I think, uh, and relatively few people after the first three months are actually switching over only about 4% of the patients. When you look at the attrition on PD, uh, sort of a similar sort of a, 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 a approach that, we, that I showed with the hemo. Um, again, a lot of people, of 380 people in the last year, 127 of them actually withdrew dialysis or died at home, um, which I think is a, a success. Um, transplantation um, uh, accounted for a fairly substantial uh, exit from the PD program as well. Um, not quite as high a proportion, I think, as we were seeing in the home hemo, but we have smaller numbers, so that certainly changes that. Um, the the la single largest reason for uh, departing was uh, technique failure, and I, I know that technique failure in the PD world is a, uh, a loaded term because it's, uh, it, it encompasses many different uh, uh, evils, but um, really these are the people that are on PD that for some reason or another transition over to um, hemodialysis. 
Looking at it again sort of graphically, uh, technique failure in the blue line here is certainly accounting for the highest amount. Um, more people opting to stay at home uh, as their last therapy uh, increasing. Uh, and transplantation, a little bit of a spike as we've seen everywhere in the last couple of years, um, uh, still accounting for a substantial number of people. In terms of the survival, and again, this is not patient survival, this is the, the technique survival, uh, and this is breaking it down by different uh, years, and you can see that they really all overlap, and there's really no differences in terms of survival on PD over this time, and the, uh, the median uh, PD technique survival is around 22 months uh, uh, for the province. Uh, jump over that. So as we look at the technique failure bucket, and this is, um, I think, uh, this is, uh, somewhat older data because this is from last year and I think there is more so hopefully Dr. Singh will be able to present some of this at some point. Um, but of the 288 technique failures in this time period, 28% uh, of those patients um, did not have a PD catheter removed and most of those people were uh, uh, counted in promise system as being a temporary transition over to hemo. 72% um, of them did have a PD tube removal, so obviously this was uh, either for a more significant infection or intended to be a more uh, permanent switch to another modality. Um, and I think they're really trying to delve down into the specifics for why catheter uh, removal is happening. So they've recognized that that's a, a marker and now they're uh, trying to uh, uh, enhance the data to, uh, uh, and to be able to look through, uh, to be able to make some trending decisions about, uh, about why that's happening. We've also heard a lot about the PD Assist program. Um, uh, so the PD Assist program has been in place as a pilot project since 2014. Um, there's now been um, a number of folks um, that have accessed it. This number is out of date, obviously. I know currently uh, the long-term uh, use, uh, the most recent uh, numbers I saw was around 54 patients on it. So this is a process whereby somebody has either a temporary or a permanent uh, challenge for doing the, the PD, and we can bring in some outside help either to help them set up the equipment, help them lift bags. Uh, sometimes it's as simple as somebody's broken their arm and they can't do it for the next six weeks while they're casted, and so we can maintain them on um, PD rather than having to convert them to hemodialysis. Um, if you look at the duration, there is a number of long-term users of this. So the median time on PD Assist is actually almost 15 months. So, um, so people um, are being maintained uh, at home uh, with some assistance through this program. So that, um, uh, I think, is, uh, is encouraging. We're actually starting to reconsider whether there's a role for a similar program in home chemo, uh, uh, although it's a more challenging uh, technology to try to deal with for the home chemo uh, assist side of things, but that's something that we're uh, going to be looking at a little bit in the next year or so. So I'm going to stop uh, at that point. Uh, I promised Chris I would try to keep it to 15 minutes, and then I'm going to hand over. Chris told me he wanted this picture used of him, and I certainly didn't steal it off his Facebook page or anything like that last night. Um, I actually found a picture of Chris uh, from about 10 years ago when he was giving a presentation for pharmacy, but I realized that none of us really want to see pictures of ourselves from 10 years ago, so I was ni nice to him there. And Sean is telling us that we have an equivalent of a drinking game for Chris's portion of the presentation. What, what catchphrases are we looking for there, Sean? Maybe you can just, so people can keep a tally and we'll see if we can get a number at the end. So on, so forth, and whatnot. Uh, so those are the catchphrases to watch out for. Um, I won't encourage drinking at uh, 10 to 8 on Friday morning, but let me hand over to Dr. Poynton, who's just finishing up his uh, home fellowship with us. Thanks, Dr. Kuplin. So uh, thanks for that intro. Hard, hard task to follow up, but uh, I'll give it a go. So today I'm, I was asked to share some of the projects that we've been working on over the past year. And so with that, uh, give a little bit of background about what uh, projected uh, these t topics and then talk a little bit about the current projects in a little bit more depth and then also allude to some of the next steps that are uh, we're excited about and are coming. So the last part of the talk was a great um, segue into this. Uh, really, we it, this was sparked by an interest in both uh, quality improvement as well as uh, home therapies and knowing that uh, the current landscape in BC, we're not doing uh, too bad actually, and especially compared to the national levels, but to perhaps better characterize that and uh, be able to describe it in more depth. 
And so uh, also looking at ways to enhance and uh, always continue looking for ways to enhance the process and enhance the numbers that uh, enter uh, foam therapies. And part of that is looking, um, as you've probably seen this slide earlier, we see that our numbers are fairly uh, stable and that there's uh, some good attrition in terms of transplantation and other attrition rates that have balanced those uh, numbers. As, and some of the, the highest yield that I could uh, see was really looking at this first component, which is truly the, the intake of patients into the program. And so that's really where I focus uh, my, kind of my research in the uh, topic. So from uh, a background in QI, I did an uh, Ishikawa diagram looking at an outcome and looking at the influencers um, that affect that outcome. And here we're looking at uh, the interest, which is how patients choose a modality and end up on that particular modality and the sequential steps in between. And so from this, a few things that uh, stood out uh, when we looked at the different parameters, and uh, there was two prongs that uh, kind of stuck out to me. One was which, of course, the patient journey itself. How, do, how does that look like? What are the steps? And uh, how can we best describe that? And what eventually doing that eagle eye view? And then if there's any uh, discre discrepancies, looking uh, for doing a deeper dive and looking for reasons why we may be losing patients. But the other prong of this was also just the care team and to see uh, what from the care team perspectives um, was their influencers, their um, thoughts and take, and how comfortable they are about speaking about home therapies to their patients, and what factors may influence uh, recommending one uh, therapy over another. And so with that, uh, I delve into the first project, which really started out as uh, trying to describe um, as, a, as somewhat of a controllable uh, project to do in a year. We said, we'll look at PD, we'll, I'll describe the steps, and uh, kind of see where a BC stands in, the, in that regards. And when, you look, when I looked at the literature, there was very sparse information in terms of an objective, described, sequential series of steps that someone would do uh, to, to take from going through modality selection to ending up on peritoneal dialysis. And so uh, there was a hypothetical six-step model that was proposed by Blake's group in Toronto. And so the, uh, that's, that's what we modeled um, our next, our project upon initially. And so through these six steps as, as uh, outlined here, we adapted it and modified it to what we expected to, to occur in BC. And through that, uh, we, we pr try to propose this through PROMISE uh, in a forward fashion, so as if patients were flowing through those six steps sequentially in a forward manner. And when we used to put this into promise and capture data, we figured out that really this was not giving us the correct information or an accurate amount of information to answer the question about the process. And so we, after looking at this and reassessing and going back to the drawing board, it was felt that perhaps we were, we need to rethink about how our approach uh, was globally. And so this when I talk about this, um, it, it essentially goes into the, the first project which we're working on, and I'll go into a little bit more depth, but the home dialysis therapies project as a whole, uh, the question now became and evolved into among end-stage renal disease patients who started chronic dialysis from 2015 to 2017, are we able to identify instances where there were missed opportunities to recruit a patient to a home therapy? Further to that, the goal would be, uh, much like the AIM statement here, is to, to, to optimize the proportion of patients uh, at end stage who are starting chronic dialysis on a home therapy in BC by reducing the amounts of missed and potentially missed opportunities, which I will define in a moment. I think it's easier to see pictorially. So again, this is where we had that initial thought, look at the process in a forward manner, but that didn't quite give us accurate information. And so going back to the drawing board, we uh, we felt that if we looked at what patients' uh, modality that they ended up on and started chronically, if we were to trace backwards or go retrospectively looking at those patients and their path to the d modality and to see what they actually chose in the beginning and to see uh, how those match up. And then, then to go and piece out the different steps that they took upon that journey. So here, for instance, uh, this is the chronic modality that uh, the patients would have ended up on. And when we go back and try to match it to the modality that they had actually originally chose, uh, this is where we define our categories. So for instance, if we had uh, patients ended up on home therapies and had originally chosen home therapies, 
that's the green box, and that would be an appropriate outcome. And again, I'm taking this from a home therapies lens, um, so just keep that in mind. Say, for instance, uh, patients ended up on in-center hemodialysis, yet originally they had chosen a home therapies as their modality of choice, then from our perspective, this would be a missed opportunity to have someone on home therapies. Equally, if you were to look here, if someone ended up on home, uh, sorry, on hemodialysis, yet, and they had chosen hemodialysis to begin with, or if they, they had, the data was missing, or they had, were undecided, as in these two columns, and they somehow stumble upon home therapies as their chronic modality, then that, again, that would be an acceptable outcome at this juncture from our perspective. Yet, if they, again, if they had chosen hemo or were undecided and ended up on in-center hemodialysis, then that would be a potential missed opportunity to recruit someone to home therapies. And so that, that formed the basis of how we uh, looked at the data moving forward. So through that, when we looked, uh, when we applied this model to Promise, from we had a selected time frame from 2015 to 2017, captured about 2,800 patients. Um, we had an exclusion criteria and a final cohort of about 1,800 patients. Uh, we followed them up to death, loss to follow up, uh, moving out of BC or January 30th, 2019. Um, and so, just to focus a bit more on the exclusion criteria here, we chose to look only at adults, and uh, we removed those that had a short time frame before uh, uh, passing away uh, on initi initiation. Uh, but one of the th key things here when we looked at the data initially is that when we excluded those with, without pre-dialysis care within the past four months of starting, um, there was quite a large number. The original thought was that if someone did not go through the traditional uh, stream of going through KCC and having the pre-dialysis care as we would expect, then uh, they may be parachuting in and having less education. So their choice would be biased. But yet, after looking at the initial data, you know, that's quite a large number of patients. And we also, as, as a group, uh, consensus was that even though someone may came in within that uh, small window, the KCC is great at providing the education in a more expedited fashion, such that they may be uh, having the same decision path uh, and level of confidence at the, at the start. So we, on the next iteration, we will include this, these patients. So this is, a, this is a few busy slides, but the key here is just to show that we do indeed have BC level data um, and that we also have the ability to break it down to health authorities, which will be one of our, our next steps in looking at uh, this a bit more in depth. Um, I get, once again, similar background information, just showing the, the, the patients that were involved in, in this time period. Uh, such as comorbidities, GFR at start. And here is just the dialysis type at, uh, at initiation. And we broke it down to uh, outpatient hemodialysis, uh, sorry, in-center, so coming from an outpatient and starting an in-center hemodialysis, as well as those who start hemodialysis uh, in an inpatient setting as an admission. And uh, when you combine those two, we find that uh, the, the numbers are, they make up two-thirds of patients starting, uh, which is not actually unsurprising based on the numbers you've seen before, but we, it's to note that only a third are starting the home uh, therapies, and so that could, be, that could be something we can work upon. So looking at those, uh, and I'll, I'll structure this a bit more uh, clearly in a second, but just, just to kind of look at that chart in comparison. Here we have, again, the, the modalities that they started upon, and looking back at those modalities that they had chosen. And so um, what we see here is that of those who chose PD, just to, again, echo what Dr. Copeland said earlier, is that a majority do, do, do start on PD itself. And so that's upwards of 80%. Um, and then there's, yet there is a group of patients in that column, or that row, I should say, that also ended up on hemodialysis. And it's a fair number. And so that's, that's something we'll be focusing on as this would be a missed opportunity. Equally on the home hemo front, um, we also have a percentage that uh, who chose home hemo that ended up on home hemo, but a good proportion as well ended up on in-center hemodialysis. So again, these, are, these two would comprise of our missed opportunities. When we looked at those who uh, say, stated that they preferred hemodialysis or were undecided uh, or had missing data, we see that there is a small group that actually stumbled upon home therapies so to speak, 
which is, again, an acceptable outcome. Yet there is quite a large number who uh, continued onwards to in-center hemodialysis, which uh, would be potentially missed opportunities to recruit a patient to home therapies in that sense. So again, a fair number. Uh, again, conservative care uh, pathways, we do see that there's a small number that ended up on hemodialysis, and then we think we've all had experiences where uh, a patient or family member would changes their mind at the end there, and so that's, that will leave out. But when we're looking at the potential missed, we ask ourselves, could they, they're potentially missed, so could they have been recruited to home therapies? And so the next question became just that. Uh, could we clarify if they had uh, a specific contraindication to home therapies and that would preclude them from even entering eligibility? And so when we looked at the PROMISE data at the best we can, could to see if they were labeled as contraindicated to home therapies, we found that only, uh, based on the data that we have, that only less than 10% were deemed not candidates based on a contraindication. So that would leave us at least with 90% of the, that 817 potentially missed that uh, could, could be potentials. Again, this is based on, on the data that we have. Uh, so really to, to pictorially look at this uh, in summary is that we have here what, what I described as missed opportunities to recruit to home therapies. Uh, if they had chosen a home therapies but ended uh, starting uh, in-center hemodialysis, so it's a fair number, whereas there's a larger proportion of those who would be potentially missed opportunities uh, if they had either chosen hemodialysis or were unsure, undecided, and they started hemodialysis in the end. So again, this is from a, a home therapies lens, and that's why uh, these are some targets we could look at. So the, the next steps would be to just have a finalized, revised data set then kind of delve further and look for those uh, specific root cause for why someone is a uh, missed or potentially missed opportunity. And uh, one of the other layers that we have captured thus far is when you're looking back at those steps and looking back at the patient journey to the modality, um, we looked at the education piece. And so looking at those potential missed opportunity, those 817 patients, we found that the majority did receive uh, orientation to all modalities, but only a small subset received home therapy specific uh, education. So we're really teasing that out a little bit more. Um, but I will use that as a segue to uh, QI projects that I'm hoping to initiate moving forward based on this, which is really we see a good number of patients who do uh, who have started hemodialysis in center and uh, would we, we would be looking to transition them to a home therapies after the fact. And we've been, there's been some, we have discussed the transitional unit and how that's been used elsewhere and how it's been implemented here locally. But I've also seen some uh, benefits with using a transition curriculum. And that's a pre-built educational piece with some exposure and as well exposure to uh, home therapies uh, staff such that uh, when the patient comes in, it's a predefined set of time uh, and education that they can go through uh, a curriculum, so to speak, and then uh, after the fact, hopefully have feel more comfortable uh, when choosing uh, between a home therapies and uh, dialysis, uh, hemodialysis otherwise. And then further, we will look at the patterns at the health authority level, so that's something that uh, we look forward to. So the next step was to go back to that um, second prong and looking at how we can maybe better sell our, uh, this topic to our, our staff and, uh, and team members. And so that kind of propagated to the next um, project that we worked on. And this was based on, the, we, when we looked at the literature to say um, how, how do staff think about home therapies and what their approach are, are uh, we found a study by uh, Karthik and Christopher Chan out east, which looked specifically at attitudes and perceptions in nephrology nurses uh, towards home therapies and uh, some of the patient and system level factors that would uh, kind of sway a, a staff member to, to recommend home versus in-center. And so they did this through a survey, and what they tried to capture was just that, uh, the perceptions. Um, and also just the secondary piece is that um, would, would the nursing staff uh, like or want uh, some education around home therapies? 
such that they would, may feel more comfortable and confident about speaking to patients about home therapies. This actually, for them, uh, when they found a discrepancy that uh, it was clearly delineated that in-center uh, nurses would lean towards in-center dialysis for regardless of some of the patient and system uh, parameters, whereas home therapies uh, nurses would lean towards home for the same parameters. And so from that, they built educational sessions and provided that to the in-center nurses based on the fact that the service said they, they would like that. And uh, they found that when doing pre and post surveys that uh, the staff felt a bit more comfortable in discussing the home therapies with their patients. So they, they actually had uh, another publication after this. Uh, so a few uh, aspects here is that, A, some of the limitations is they, they looked at nurses only. It was done at one tertiary uh, care center in Toronto. And uh, just due to the scale and scope, um, they did have a smaller number uh, of respondents. And so when uh, looking to kind of characterize the current landscape in BC, uh, thought we could expand upon this and uh, perhaps have a, a bigger look and a bit more robust look. And that led us to, to the Home Dialysis Therapies Perception Survey. And so here the aim was to evaluate the current perceptions of home therapies amongst all renal uh, care team members and within various regions of uh, the care, um, nephrology care across the province. And as a secondary part would be also to look at to see if there's any education that the staff may want and how to best provide that around home therapies. And so um, with permission of the U of T team, we, I was able to adapt the survey um, and kept the core similar so that it allows us to perhaps compare to Toronto later on at two major centers. Uh, but also I recreated the survey, uh, adapted to BC, um, distributed this electronically across all health authorities between January and February of earlier this year. And then uh, the completed uh, survey results were uh, compiled and the results analyzed. And so happy to share some of that with you today. Uh, the flow for, for this, well, we had a potential of 700 respondents. Uh, with the sur survey duration, I attained about 368 or about 53%. We, uh, after coming together as a group, we discussed that um, we would exclude those without uh, a specific role or defining role in terms of uh, what uh, their clinical role is, and also those who did not have a predetermined area that they, they specified as their, their main work uh, area. Uh, so with that, we, we ended up with a final cohort of about 334 or 48% 40, uh, of respondents. So from that, uh, again, a couple busy slides, but just to point out that uh, the way we, we broke up the respondents and how we grouped them, we chose to look at nephrologist um, and allied health, uh, which has been underreported in the literature uh, thus far. And then looking at the nurse uh, category here, we broke it down into uh, three sub sub uh, topics here. One is the facility nurses, which is includes the in-center and community dialysis unit nurses. Uh, we have the home nurses here, which is the PD and home hemo. And then we have CKD, which is essentially the KCC or pre-dialysis care nurses. Uh, and so this is just to show that we had, you know, uh, a majority of respondents were female, uh, varying ages, varying uh, health authorities, and varying clinical areas, which we would expect is how we kind of define this these uh, branches. But uh, further here, just to show that we captured a bit more about the, the background, the education, and just look kind of like uh, at the workforce demographic. Uh, interestingly, just as, as potential comparators, when we look at Toronto versus uh, our uh, nursing staff here, we do have less of the CNEF designation, um, especially in the home therapies, uh, which is a designation that uh, specifies and gives extra training around modality selection and education. So then uh, one of the interesting questions uh, that I thought was, uh, what renal replacement therapy would you choose as a staff for yourself if ever required? And so um, interestingly, the vast majority of the staff, regardless of role and uh, clinical area, predominantly, as you can see here, by a fair margin chose a home therapy as what they would have uh, choose, chosen for themselves. Uh, and so we can see that there's an appreciation of the home therapies from that, the staff level if they were to choose it for themselves. 
Uh, interestingly, uh, in-center and conservative management were, were fairly equivalent um, across the board as well. So then the next question was, well, what, who has the perceived impact on a patient's uh, ch choice of modalities? And so here I, I you know, beyond the, the patient themselves, which is, of course, ranked highly, I, showed, I just wanted to show some of the dichotomy and some of the spectrum that we had. And so of the, of the respondents uh, within, again, the, the different branches that we mentioned earlier, we looked at who they felt had perceived impact. And um, nephrologists were deemed to have, were perceived to have a good impact on the modality selection. And yet, um, if we looked at the, the perceived impact of in-center dialysis nurses, uh, they were ranked uh, lower from an Im impact standpoint. And uh, this seems to be a trend when uh, we looked at the nursing staff um, breakdown for, for other nurses as well, is that uh, there was an underappreciation and undervaluation of, on, in terms of self uh, per perception of impact. And so from that, another question, well, oh, this came up already, but who, who is educating patient on renal replacement therapy? And so this is where the respondents uh, would say uh, on a scale of disagree to agree and strongly agree that yes, I do educate patients on renal replacement therapies. And it was interesting to see here if we focus, and this is the frequency of uh, respondents saying uh, these, these uh, factors, if we look at agree and uh, strongly agree, which is the purple and blue, we see that nephrologists, yes, the majority of the time they're um, perceiving that they provide education, fair, allied health, allied health also here at a variable amounts, but you know, 50 percent said they do provide some uh, education uh, on renal replacement therapy. And interestingly here, the focus on the nursing staff, we can see that uh, the vast majority perceived that they were providing education and that they are uh, educating patients on renal replacement therapy, including the facility nurses, which again, by a fair margin, were uh, felt that they were providing education. So it was interesting to see the evolution of this, uh, of the perceptions of how they go about this, um, just focusing on the nursing staff here, is that, you know, we had uh, a varying degree of, of perceived impact, and even though they, they have, uh, they, some of the nursing staff felt that they had, um, they were underappreciating their impact, we can see that the, they also felt they were educating uh, patients. And so, you know, I think it's important to note that, you know, that the exposure, especially of time, of the uh, in-center uh, nurses uh, is quite large um, with patients, right? There's a lot of exposure, so that, that would be something we uh, would like to focus on. That said, um, I also, we also asked the respondents about any particular patient factors, patient level factors, that would influence uh, their recommendations for in-center versus home therapies. Um, and so here we, we had a scale of one being strongly in-center hemodialysis and five being strongly home therapies. And we looked at median scores for each of the different uh, care team members. And we looked at patient factors such as uh, poor socioeconomic status, multiple comorbidities, age greater than 70, um, a lack of support, and uh, a lack of uh, on continuing education. And so what we find here, and as I try to, to best display this, is to just you can see this, the symbols here, uh, there was a good concordance that if someone is working full time, that being in a home therapies uh, modality would be beneficial for the patient and that, that they would recommend it there. Um, yet, interestingly, for all, all other factors, just generalizing here, would be to say that um, nephrologists and allied health tended to be more neutral and uh, they ended up more down the middle here at three. But interestingly, the in-center facility nurses, uh, for the most part, chose in-center based or facility based uh, dialysis uh, for the remaining factors. Whereas the dichotomy is that with the home nurses and uh, pre-dialysis or CKD nurses, they had a more a preference towards home therapies. So just to illustrate this in a little bit more detail, we'll just focus on the burgundy here, which is the facility nurses and the bars. And you can see that they tended to be more strongly towards in-center dialysis uh, for poor socioeconomic status. And again, just focusing on the bars here, multiple comorbidities, more towards in-center rather than uh, the rest of the group. 
Likewise for age, you can see here, and a lack of support, similar, similar patterns and distribution. So from there, uh, we also asked the respondents, is there any system level factors that uh, may influence you to choose one or the other? And these are things such as a lower uh, cost to the patient, a lower cost to the system, um, a lower risk, uh, better survival and better quality of life. And so here, very similar, uh, one being strongly in center, uh, five being strongly home therapies. With the median scores, we find that there's more concordance between amongst the groups, uh, amongst the care team members here at the various uh, system factors. We find that, uh, as you can probably see, there is more leniency towards home therapies for most of these. And interestingly, there, uh, when we say lower cost to the patient and better quality of life, there was a resounding uh, agreement uh, for those aspects. So again, just to illustrate that, you know, the, the healthcare team uh, would, you know, I choose home therapies for themselves. They, they see some of the benefits of home therapies uh, at a system level and in some, even some at the patient level. So then the next question became, what would be an ideal ratio of home therapy um, in BC and what, what do we want to move towards? And so we asked the respondents, what is the ideal mix or ratio for home therapies in conjunction with in-center and other modalities? And so what we, uh, this is just to illustrate one aspect of this is that when we asked what the current breakdown, what they felt was the current proportion of patients on in-center hemodialysis, across the board, about 60 to 65 percent of, uh, of patients were felt to be on in-center hemodialysis currently. And in an ideal situation, uh, all respondents all across the board felt that if we could decrease this amount and move patients towards home therapies, including PD and home hemo, that that would be an ideal situation. Uh, Lastly, I mentioned the education piece, and when we asked, is there a need for more home therapies education, uh, resoundingly, the nurses and allied health were, were saying they were in agreement that further education would be beneficial, and they, they did prefer practical education or online uh, CMEs to kind of help bolster that piece, and that's what they would uh, welcome. Uh, this is the third point here is just that uh, respondents across the board also felt that patients could be better educated uh, moving forward, especially during that uh, transition period. So I think that alludes back to the project that uh, gives a little bit more fodder to that project initially about the transitional uh, curriculum. So next steps, we're finalizing the data analysis. Uh, we're I'm also, again, hoping to build a few more QI initiatives around education piece, but this time at a staff perspective and being able to provide that uh, practical education piece that, uh, and then also demystifying some aspects of patient factors uh, where we see that dichotomy in, in center and home therapies and also kind of uh, solidify some of the system factors that were already ingrained in respondents and then cr create that education piece, disseminate provincially and then see if uh, our, our staff members are more confident in home therapies. And then of course to look at patterns at health authorities and to see if there's any discrepancies at that aspect. And then uh, as a third uh, discussion point here, we are uh, meeting with, a, I was able to meet with a group of uh, nephrologists across Canada and uh, led by a Dr. Sam Silver. And we're looking at the home therapies uh, specifically from my perspective. We're looking at uh, a national quality uh, QI initiative and looking to say what are the provinces measuring as QI uh, indicators, but also to kind of come together and evaluate some QI indicators that could be potentially beneficial across the board, and then to hopefully facilitate multi-center QI projects um, in the future. So we had our first meeting in, uh, at the CSN and it was uh, uh, quite promising. So uh, overall, that was a whirlwind of some of the projects. Uh, obviously, you can see my excitement and passion for these projects, but I could not have done it without uh, a lot of support from uh, Drs. Copeland Singh, from the home therapies, uh, all the allied health uh, and nephrologists and uh, nurses, uh, as well as BC Renal, um, and especially thanks to, to Mark and Lee with the data collection and help there. And so uh, thank you to, for all your support. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Great, so we, are in, we certainly have some time for a couple of questions. Uh, I do want to uh, also acknowledge the work that Chris has done and also Mark uh, Caney who helped a lot with the uh, analysis, particularly on the second one. Uh, I think Chris has actually been really uh, productive in the year on his uh, home fellowship, so we hope to be able to 
operationalize some of the stuff you're talking about. So I don't know if there's any questions about uh, home therapies, hopefully directed at Chris more than me. Sean. Chris, thanks for that um, talk. I'm interested in your um, sort of heat map diagram of patients that uh, choose one modality and end up on another modality and your assessment of an absolute contraindication to a home-based therapy. Um, you know, so I, I, sometimes data collection and promise can be a little bit uh, sparse or um, uh, not 100% accurate. And so I guess I'm wondering um, how reliable you think that data element is for contraindication and whether or not you have the capacity to look at those transitions uh, stratified based on something that might be a little bit more robustly captured like uh, a general comorbidity index like the Charleston comorbidity index of some sort to see you know are, are you seeing different sort of burdens of overall medical illness in patients who choose PD or home hemo and end up on that versus patients who uh, uh, you know end up on hemo and, and whether or not you know you're seeing actually relatively similar transitions within like stratified within levels of general medical comorbidity? That's a great question. And uh, I knew that would, would come up because it is an interesting piece. And uh, w part of looking at the promise data is we have to, you know, work with the current definitions and then, and then the different iterations of promise. And so this was the best capture we could for uh, contraindications. We, had, we were unable to get the root cause and why the, the, or what defined contraindications in that. So I still feel there, even though I, the numbers look very promising, 90%, I do think there's a subset that we're going to find that are contraindicated. But A, we need to define what those parameters are. And two, exactly, maybe perhaps going back, and, and, and that's part of the QI aspect. Like now that we've identified an area that we would like to be better defined, we need to apply a more strategic uh, venue there. But also, yeah, to use a predetermined score or illness burden and, and see if we can go at it that way. And we may need to look at small sample size, looking at a proportion, and then identifying root cause and then extrapolating to the bigger group. So um, I do think that the data is somewhat limited based on that. We are, we are trying to do what we can with what we, we have. But uh, that's the next step, to clearly define those, uh, what is contraindication and uh, having a more robust number there. I just add maybe um, being more clear about what the definition of a medical contraindication is because I believe that data collection comes from the KCC referral form um, and that KCC referral form um, may be filled out quite early in the patient's care um, so there's quite a few limitations as you mentioned. Yeah, and, and again, yeah, just to lead back, that's a limitation of the data set that we're working with, but it also gives us a, a segue into what maybe we can ask moving forward to gather that as you state. I'd say we find that as a theme in all the areas as we're trying to break down the uh, exits, both in PD and hemo, that uh, it's very easy to say unspecified or a uh, very generic term. and. You have to balance it by not making it too complicated because then people won't fill it out if it's too complicated. So it's, it's a challenge. I can't really see. I know we have Victoria and Nanaimo and St. Paul's on. Are there any questions at uh, any of those sites? Yeah, uh, Caroline here. Can you hear me in Victoria? Yeah, yeah we can yeah, hear Good morning. Um, thanks for all this. And um, just, to, I mean, our numbers are relatively small, but wanted to share with you an experience that hopefully won't reflect. Um, general limitations in the data collection. We had a look at our patients who had selected home hemo as a preferred modality through KCC and didn't end up on that therapy. And they were highly comorbid patients. And I would say that home hemo was sort of an optimistic um, projection for therapy for them. And in those case reviews, I looked back and I said, this was just, it, it, perhaps it was how it unfolded. There were health issues in the interim but not a single one of them would have been suitable for home hemo. And I think even looking back, that was a really interesting thing to reflect on. Um, I, I wonder, you know, we've, we've started to do sort of a top to bottom look at how patients are selected and how to improve our numbers. And I think there's so much unintended and implicit messaging about quote unquote danger of home dialysis in particular. Patients come into a renal unit, they see highly, um, highly diseased patients, often inpatients, lots of IV medications, nursing assistants, and I, and I wish there was a way that we can change their experience. 
Um, and I wonder if there's some way of getting at a patient experience and looking in the future for those patients who chose a home modality or were in that gray area, could go either way, looking at the experience of patients that end up home, asking them how, what were the major factors that, that made them choose it and end up getting there, and looking for the patients who were potentially go in that direction but ended up staying, and why did they stay? Yeah, I think that's that's you know the thing. One of the things I found most interesting in the uh, in the second project that Chris uh, presented was the um, the relative, uh, I guess, relatively low um, sense of the importance of the nursing role in this. Uh, because our perception, my perception, has certainly always been that the nurse uh, in the facility dialysis units can make or break uh, a plan with a single sentence. So. Uh, I think that that's a really interesting thing. I actually um, was really surprised to see uh, that uh, there was concordance that the nephrologist was actually the one that was really driving the modality decision because I really, in my mind, think of it more of what the nurse's education component is. So I think that's actually an opportunity for some education to the nurses about the role that they play because I think they underappreciate the role that they play. Um, I think the other part that comes in um, uh, you know, next stage as an example in the U.S. and their units have started a very formalized curriculum for all comers starting a dialysis program, irrespective of whether people think they have high comorbidities or whether they would be a good candidate for home or not. Um, everyone comes in and goes through a standardized first three to four weeks process uh, of uh, education and you know, a sober second thought for the people that have chosen hemo that maybe there's something else now that they see what the reality of in-center hemo may be for them. Um, I think that's one of the possibilities that we can look at uh, to try to have more of a curriculum base for all comers. And I think we are uh, all still guilty, and I point my, the finger at myself first of this, of thinking that we know the, the patients that are going to be good or bad, and repeatedly we've been surprised by the people we think are going to be the fantastic ones on home hemo who are... Uh, you know, have really struggle with it, and the people we think are going to be disasters and are very borderline who become the model patients. So I think we don't have that uh, ability to make a really clear uh, call there. So I think I'd be interested, and Chris and I have started to talk a little bit about that, about some curriculum design for, for patients coming in. I think St. So, Paul's, is there a question at St. Paul's? Yeah. Hi, it's Monica. Thanks, Chris. Um, now that you have those 135 people in your red mismatched, it might be nice also to see if we could get a cohort of those patients and ask if they got the right therapy for them. Because just like they'll be, just like you mentioned, Mike, we um, really do promote home-based therapies in the KCC and maybe there are that cohort of patients that actually did wind up on their right therapy and their right therapy was hemo. So it won't be all but it'd be nice to hear from them if they, if it was right patient, right therapy, right time, and if not all of those were mismatched just based on absolute comorbidities, but actually did wind up on the therapy that they chose, because choice is still a factor. Uh, that's a great point. Uh, with this first iteration, we focused on the potential, but on the second as uh, part of uh, iteration, we will be including those 135 in our total numbers. Because uh, as, you, as you commented, uh, that would be a great group to kind of uh, parcel out a little bit more and get a little bit more information of what they look like and what, what path they took in more detail. So for sure, that's coming. Sorry, right, Chris. So we're just, uh, oh, go, yeah, go ahead, Abid. Um, sorry, Chris. I, I thank you. That was um, really well done. Um, I trust you've seen Rob Quinn's data on modality selection um, where he went through his steps and identified, you know, where the barrier was and where people ended up choosing the wrong step any thought that we'll drill this down a little deeper to say, you know, in that, in those people that chose PD, the 20% that didn't end up on PD, what happened? Because um, I think that while that number is not large and we've made a big impact cutting it from sort of 50% to 80%, um, it would be nice to know what those barriers were because sometimes identifying those things can help out. I don't know if you'll get the data down to that level, but it would be nice if we could. Uh, great segue into, uh, that's a great point. And when we initially chose a series of steps, and again, that was the application of it moving forward, uh, we were looking at, you know, can we define the path and the, in terms of the sequential, sequential steps? And if we found uh, a decrease or loss of patients in one of those particular steps to do a deeper dive and look for modifiable and non-modifiable barriers at that juncture. And so really this is the first piece where we, we found that looking forward didn't work, but look, trying to trace back 
um, the steps seems to be a bit better of a way to, to define that. So we've now looked at education, but we're also going to be looking at uh, the other steps, including, you know, for instance, access, uh, PD access, PD initiation and training. And then if we see that there's a decrease in or a loss of patients at those steps, uh, we will look for modifiable, non-modifiable uh, barriers at that time. So th it is to come. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, it's Friday morning, it's 8.30. Uh, we can get back to our regular routines. Thanks everyone.